Hello, I'm sorry to interrupt the iconic song, Route 66. I'm Ted Leverett, broadcasting from PartnerOnCall.com. I'm the original business buyer advocate. You're listening to another one of my continuing education podcasts, and it's for professionals and for people who want to know what professionals know. Our topic is the fatal flaw killing owners and business buyers and some of their advisors. The tune Route 66, it's about what some people say are the good old days, a time when all kinds of businesses and towns were thriving along Route 66, you know, from Chicago to LA, more than 2,000 miles all the way. And then the marketplace changed. A sprawling network of interstate freeways. People preferring other kinds of vacations. Driving tours and roadside attractions became passe. Today, Route 66 is a decommissioned U.S. highway, mostly crumbling, partly inaccessible. Dying slow deaths were the owners of thousands of businesses, and hundreds of towns suffered vanishing prosperity. Now, the towns probably could not have done much to avoid the devastation, but lots of business owners could have gotten out while the getting out was good. Instead, too many of them got caught holding the bag. Seeing only some of the picture can be fatal. 2020 hindsight is for losers. Now think about this. As you widen your perspective of a picture, you see more of it. But until you see the entire picture, you don't know what the picture is about. And that may be fine for looking at pictures, but it can be fatal seeing only some of the picture when buying, selling, financing, or advising businesses. You see, advisors and valuators expose themselves to malpractice if they don't know enough about the risk of short-sightedness. This can really make the day, by the way, for litigation attorneys and their expert witnesses. I want to tell you about 66 factors that contribute to or have an influence on the fatal flaw. And you can use these 66 factors to test during due diligence, and you can negotiate from the 66 factors. My podcast and its supplemental PDF will enlighten people thinking about selling, buying, or starting a business. Advisors, you can sharpen your focus. Sources of financing, well, if you heed my advice, you can avoid financing losers. And business brokers, well, you can use this insight to slap into reality wishful thinking sellers who want you, the brokers, to work for them, hoping for sales commissions that you know are rarely going to be paid. You see, it's a sad day when buyers get less than they thought they would when they buy a business. It's also an unhappy day for business owners to discover too late that nobody will buy their company, at least on terms that make sellers happy. My podcast defines the fatal flaw. The supplemental PDF that goes with this podcast explains how to avoid the fatal flaw. So 
How much do you know about the business trinity? This trinity determines the worthiness of a company. The business trinity consists of three major factors. And because of their interactions with each other, they positively or negatively affect companies. And not just the business enterprise. They also affect the interrelationships involving owners, managers, customers, employees, suppliers, advisors, and sources of financing. These three factors are simultaneously alive full time within every company. It's how they relate to each other in real time that creates a company's opportunities and or vulnerabilities. Marketability, liquidity, competitive advantage. Those three factors are distinct. Their interactions create one organism, which is the business enterprise. Now, thanks to a little help from my friends, I've isolated and focused on 66 of the factors that constitute and affect the business trinity. Lots of people can accurately define each of these factors, but more important is to know what to look for and how to assess the numerous elements that constitute each factor. It's the relativity we should be thinking about. Please don't be like the people who say, oh, Ted, I already know about this and what to do about it. The reality, few people actually know enough about this. You're going to know more about 66 factors that business buyers can get wrong during due diligence and valuation. It can be fatal for buyers who misunderstand as few as one of these factors. But companies that pass these tests, oh boy, they can be the best kinds of acquisitions. Now, before I get into the list of 66 factors, we need to agree on a few definitions of terminology. The definitions I suggest, they're not mine. They're the usual and customary definitions in use by much, if not most, of the business appraisal and deal-making industries. These definitions are also in use by various kinds of buyers, or excuse me, ad advisors to buyers and sellers of privately held small and mid-sized businesses. If you carefully listen to the definitions and if you comprehend them, you will be miles ahead of everyone else during evaluation and deal-making. Such as when you bring your company to market or when you evaluate businesses to purchase or if you're a source of financing, when you review funding applications from potential borrowers. So here we go with, with a few definitions. There are only about five or six of them. Marketability. Well, marketability is defined in the International Glossary of Business Valuation Terms. They define it as the ability to quickly convert property to cash at minimal costs. Some experts expand that definition saying with a high degree of certainty of realizing the anticipated amount of proceeds. Next definition, lack of marketability. Well, that's the relative absence of marketability. What about liquidity? Well, liquidity in the context of my presentation, um, 
We're not talking about liquidate or liquidation. It doesn't refer to the sale of assets for pennies on the dollar, what you'll see when companies are in trouble. I'm talking about liquidity and liquidate referring to converting the value of a company into cash for the seller. Discounts. A discount for lack of marketability is an amount or percentage deducted from the value of an ownership interest to reflect the relative absence of marketability. There are other discounts, for example, um, lack of liquidity. Here's the definition so far in this podcast for competitive advantage. Competitive advantage exists when a company's profit and reputation is above the norm for its industry. And of course, we're talking about fatal, the fatal flaw. Here's the definition for fatal. Owners can't sell. Buyers won't or can't buy. Or buyers make a lousy deal, which can result in the acquisition's failure. The interactions of the 66 factors, which I'll individually explain later, are taking place in every business. While it's happening, the worthiness of the company can be strengthened or weakened. And as I said a little while ago, this affects marketability, liquidity, competitive advantage. Unhealthy and sometimes not easily detected interactions can devastate the buyers of companies and the sources of financing that enable the buy-sell transaction. Too many buyers, for example, perceive companies to be just fine. But in fact, some of these companies are eroding. Remember what happened along Route 66? It took a long time to kill off so many businesses and towns. People paying attention saw what was coming. The smartest business owners sold their companies to buyers. Why? Because those owners had a sense of what was coming and the buyers could not read the signs or ignored the warnings. Competitive advantage heavily affects marketability and liquidity. There is no liquidity without marketability. And while the company's performance affects marketability, something else can undermine the marketability of the best performing businesses. That something else is the marketplace. Remember Route 66. The volatility of the buy-sell marketplace affects the ability for owners to sell their company. Sometimes it's temporary, sometimes permanent. Later in my presentation, I'll explain several other factors that can pull the rug from under companies for sale, even the most successful businesses. One more time, this trinity determines the worthiness of a company. It determines whether or not an owner can sell a business to a buyer on terms satisfactory to the seller. Now, if you'd like to take a brief break, go ahead. Now's a good time. I'll be here when you come back. Okay. Today, today before this fun, <laughs> today before this podcast, I read a news article. It brings to life the practical application of lack of markability and the discount to a company valuation because of that lack of marketability. And here's what it is. The headline, Tesla stock plunges $5.5 billion as Model 3 suffers a six-month delay. The company declared a large quarterly loss and finally acknowledged that deliveries of its high-volume Model 3 will be delayed by at least six months. Hey, what's that sound? Oh, I know. It's the other shoe. The one that's going to drop 
on Tesla's investors. How many electric powered cars are going to be sold and at what profit to the company if and when the U.S. government stops, and, and some states too, by the way, stops subsidizing federal and state tax credits? Folks, when the demand from business buyers goes down, even for small and mid-sized companies, the businesses may not be marketable. The owners may not be able to convert, which means liquidate their business net worth into their personal account without a huge discount for lack of marketability. Now, if you read the PDF report, I'm going to have lots of examples showing how that happens. But you're still not convinced? Well, how about this example? Another news story this week reports, headline, when mom and pop can't sell, can't, cannot sell the farm, or in this case, the theme park. The elderly couple has run this place for 43 years, 43 years, long time, and is finally ready to retire. Similar family-owned theme parks dotted the country in the 1950s. Are you remembering Route 66? But guess what, listeners? Roadside attractions don't interest enough people. Mom and Pop's business is in a dead or dying industry. Kids don't want to get all hot and bothered traipsing around a be a farmer for a day theme park. They have cell phones, Snapchat, Facebook, and so do their parents. All right, so far we've defined marketability liquidity, and the discounts to the value of something such as a business for sale due to lack of marketability and or lack of liquidity. And I've also touched upon competitive advantages. Now, let's emphasize sustainable competitive advantage. Warren Buffett says the most important thing he looks for when evaluating a company is its sustainable competitive advantage. On the basis of my four decades valuing small and mid-sized companies and advising buyers, sellers, and their advisors, I believe that the fatal flaw is in the thinking and behavior of deal makers. It infects deals. It happens when the parties to the deal do not adequately understand and put a price tag on or deduct a penalty for the elements that contribute to sustainable, sustainable competitive advantages. And I hope to prove this to you as I list, um, well, what many observers cite as the contributors to a company's competitive advantage. So let's further define a company's competitive advantage. Competitive advantage exists when a company's profit and reputation is above the norm for its industry. It occurs when the company is more capable than its competitors at managing the resources available to it, such as a superior product with an outstanding value proposition. Perspective. A business does not earn a true competitive advantage because of a windfall or a lucky year. Its advantages must be sustainable. This is what separates the good businesses from the superior ones. In a while, I'm going to tell you about four things that professionals look for to assess competitive advantage for every kind of company. Well, how about a reality check? Risk is embedded in every kind and size of business. It does not have to be fatal, but you must find that risk and you must learn to control it. Otherwise, they don't call it fatal for nothing. 
Let's, let's think about the reason for the failure of so many buyers of small and mid-sized businesses. I'm, I'm referring to two types of failure. First, the inability to achieve a done deal. And the second kind of failure is the inability to sell or profitably sell the company when it's time to get out. You see, the fatal flaw is why so many owners can't sell their small and mid-sized business. I'm going to say it again. The fatal flaw is in the thinking and behavior of deal makers. It infects deals. It happens when the parties to the deal do not adequately understand and put a price tag on or deduct a penalty for the elements that contribute to sustainable competitive advantages. Competitive advantage heavily affects marketability and liquidity. There is no liquidity without marketability. And while the company's performance affects marketability, something else can undermine the marketability of the best performing businesses, the marketplace. Now I'm using some repetition here because these concepts are so simple to understand when you hear it and so easy to forget. Remember why we're talking about this. Too many small and mid-sized businesses cannot be sold. And too many buyers cannot profitably sell the company they bought. I want to help you avoid being caught holding a worthless bag of business potential. Let's recognize another fact of life. Most of us don't know what we don't know. It doesn't have to be that way if we gather insights from people who know more than we do. This podcast, for example, when I was outlining it in the last couple of weeks, it was going to focus on 28 factors that I thought could add to or detract from the value of small and mid-sized businesses. Turns out that there are 66, not 28. Thanks to what I learned from numerous experts on the buying, selling, financing, and advisory playing field. So, if it can happen to me, it can happen to you. Can any of us afford not to know what we don't know? <laughs> Besides, what I recently learned, I'm going to share with you um, some of the 500 year collective experience that, that I and the business buyer advocates in my group have collected over the years when we've been working with buyers, sellers, and their advisors. We've been involved with thousands of potential and actual buy sell transactions. And since the 1970s, we faced off with sellers and their representatives. And the sad truth is, quite a few sellers do not have a clue about what it takes to close win-win transactions. And too many brokers and buyers waste their time, money, and patience on unsaleable businesses. Where you start determines where you end up. A chain reaction occurs once you begin the process of selling your business. It is difficult to stop it. You can be swept along to your detriment in the wrong direction if you're not totally prepared. Okay, I'm going to cover a list of factors. These are among the topics suitable for inquiry by everyone involved in the marketing of businesses for sale and everyone interacting with each other during the process of deal making. Okay, relax. If you're thinking I'm going to try harder to put you asleep during this podcast, I know some of this is technical. It's kind of boring to listen to. Um, it's even kind of boring for me to voice some of this stuff. In fact, this is probably going to be the most boring presentation I've ever made. Don't tell me I did one more boring, please. Uh, but it's important stuff, and that's why I need to get it out. Don't worry. I'm also going to share with you lots of juicy, easy-to-understand observations and recommendations. You will achieve better deals if you put to use what I'm covering. The PDF, which supplements this, this podcast, 
has all the boring technical details, in addition to the ones that are boring in this podcast. The PDF also reveals and explains the factors I do not cover during this podcast. The PDF contains the transcript of this podcast and many more facts, tips, and strategies for deal making. So, coming now in this podcast, I'm going to cover a few of the 66 factors that contribute to or have an influence on the fatal flaw. It's how they relate to each other in real time, remember, that creates the company's opportunities or vulnerabilities. So remember, the business trinity, marketability, liquidity, competitive advantage. Keep that in mind in the background all the time. Time for another break. Be back in a moment. Okay, here we go. There, I'm going to cover 11 of the 66 factors. I'm going to cover them in alphabetical order. Some of them are more important than others. Many of the most important ones are explained in the PDF that supports this podcast. Why? Because they take a whole lot more words, and I don't want to voice them, and you probably don't want to hear them right now. Get the PDF report. Barrier to entry. Easy entry by startups into industry. Is it? It's not just startups. Companies and industries that have not encroached upon businesses in another industry or in their own industry can strike fast. Online sellers are an example, but here's another one, just from today's newspaper. Bass Pro Shops and J.C. Penney are among the big box retailers diversifying into the sale of toys, which is hurting Toys R Us and all the mom and pop toy stores. Number two, continuity of profit. Has the company been adequately profitable for the most recent 36 months? If not, why not? The safest and most profitable acquisitions report a profit at or above the industry average. Continuity of profit is an indicator of sustainable competitive advantage, and that affects the marketability of companies for sale, which enables owners to transfer their business net worth into their personal cash. Historical performance, it's important, but not as important as where the business is going and how much profit it can earn. Think Route 66 businesses. Number three, dependency on the owner. John Martinka, in his book, If They Can Sell Pet Rocks, Why Can't You Sell Your Business for What You Want? John advises company owners, it is absolutely critical that you eliminate the most critical dependency a firm can have, which is when everything or a majority of things are dependent upon the owner's involvement. Delegate. So here's a tip. Investors and sources of financing could force the owner to buy life and disability insurance, making themselves the beneficiary, or they could avoid companies where the owner is the business. Number four, desirability of the company. This is a little different than marketability. Desirability is the degree to which buyers seek this type of business. It's, it's the appeal of a particular company to potential purchasers of that kind of businesses. And it's usually perceived on the basis of profitability. Sometimes um, it's the product or the location of the business. Desirability refers to a particular individual purchaser, not the collective opinion of a group of potential purchaser. 
as this applies to an individual, it's the warm and fuzzy feeling. As to a group, it relates to the relative marketability of a business. So we use the marketability factor to rate this. People I've trained, well, they and I test for several attributes to measure desirability. Without explicit testing, it's like trying to walk on quicksand. Number five, financeability. Financeability has to do with ability to pay. Ability to pay. It's the ability for something to be financed or to receive financing. Financeability hugely affects marketability. It affects liquidity. Here's a tip. Street smart business deal makers measure the financeability early in their evaluation of potential mergers and acquisitions. Is the company financeable right now for its present ownership? How long has it been financeable? Is financing available for a merger or acquisition? And what about financing after closing the buy, sell, or merger transaction? The sad truth, there are wonderful companies to own for their current owner. But if financing is not readily available, the company may not be purchasable. Now we're going to talk a little bit more, take a little different view into marketability. Here we're talking about saleability. And I'm talking about marketability of companies within an industry. So we're talking about relativity. It's how easy it is to sell them, how long does it take to sell them. It's the degree to which the type, size, and location of this particular company is in constant demand by potential buyers and therefore relatively easy to sell. In other words, to what degree are there today and any day ready, willing, and able buyers for a particular kind, size, and location of company? Don't confuse marketability with value. What if too few buyers want to purchase the type of business you want to buy? You could pay a fair price only to discover that you cannot sell your business. Marketability has to do with how much constant demand exists among business buyers for this type and quality of business. It also has to do with the economy. High interest rates or rising interest rates, for example, can lower profitability and make it more difficult for a buyer to arrange acquisition financing. An infiltration of an industry by franchises can repel buyers if the franchises saturate the field with competitors. So here's a tip for sellers. There are numerous creative ways to sell companies, ESOPs. Hire your buyer. Bring in an investor who's also a working partner who will, who will contribute skills and, and with you improve the company's competitive advantages. And here's a tip for buyers. Don't buy it if you can't sell it at a profit. Don't finance it unless you're sure you'll be fully paid. And if you're a business broker, don't list it without receiving an upfront non-refundable fee from the company. Or perhaps better, don't list it at all. Let a competing broker waste time, money, and reputation. Number seven, remember number seven of 11, scalable opportunity. A scalable business has the potential to move beyond the founders, beyond where they are today. Often the, 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 the defining characteristic of a scalable company is the ability to replicate, create multiple copies of a similar product or service without substantive modification rather than one-of-a-kind items. This can lead to 
decreasing marginal costs where, as production increases, the resources needed to make the next item or provide the next increment of service go down. Scalable companies are more likely to appeal to investors and to employees and to sources of financing, which help these kinds of scalable companies grow. The savviest buyers love scalability. They look for ways to build a scalable model. Now, I got some information on that topic from fundingsage.com. Don't worry, it's in the uh, PDF with a link. Um, you could Google examples of a scalable business model. Number eight, we, can't, we cannot minimize this one. Sellers offering terms of sale. It's the asking price in related terms. It's the provisions the seller says up front the seller wants in the buy-sell contract. It's the, it's, the, it's the characteristics, the elements, the structure of the transaction. If it's not reasonable, if buyers are not going to want to know about it, there's not going to be a deal. Don't assume seller financing is a good thing. Nowadays, sellers are touting I'll finance, I'll finance, or I'll finance part of it. If a source of financing, other than the seller, will not fund your acquisition buyers, you may be making a buying mistake. It's a good idea to look into alternative sources of financing, even if the seller volunteers to finance your deal. What you learn from, let's say, institutional lenders will sharpen your due diligence and deal making. I and my colleagues, we employ various tests to compare the offerings of companies for sale. Why? Because knowing the relative context of their asking prices and other terms, uh, well, it's, it's about as important as the, the statistics pertaining to how the business operates now and to the statistics pertaining to the, the deals that, that have been made. Number nine, buyers expected return on investment. Sellers, you better pay attention to this because it just amazes me how many sellers and their representatives have not figured out what kind of ROI buyers for their kind of business are going to want. The most successful buyers of businesses, they limit their searches to only include companies that can provide the buyer's re required return on investment. But that's not enough. They not only want a return on their investment, they want a return of their investment. Better yet, they want the company to sell for more than the price the buyer paid for it. Now, buyers, they... they buyers we work with, they use the justification for purchase test. And this goes beyond your post-sale cash flow forecast. Besides making sure businesses will not become insolvent because of the way you structure your purchase or the decisions you make to manage it, the justification for purchase test also examines your return on investment. And that includes the payback period. In other words, the amount of time for it takes you, the buyer, to recoup your investment in the business. This test helps you make a more realistic budget and it will provide insight into the price, the down payment, and the other terms of purchase. We're at number 10, two to go. Advisory team. How advisors counsel clients has a huge impact on the marketability of companies for sale. Avoid advisors that kill deals that should occur. Your advisors, they need to be knowledgeable. They need to be committed to the deal. They need to be facilitators. As to selecting your advisory team, hire people with a proven history of working for buyers and sellers of the kind and size of deal you intend. Ask, how have they facilitated deals that should and did occur? Hire deal makers, deal closers. Avoid the wrong kind of deal killer. And you know there are two kinds of deal killers. There are the advisors who don't know enough 
about deal making for small and mid sized companies. Not wanting to make mistakes, these posers are more likely to poo poo deals or worse, bless them. The other kind of deal killer is adequately experienced, which means when they try to kill a deal, do it. <laughs> Deal Killers and Deal Killing for Business Sellers and Buyers is the title of one of my most popular teleseminars. You can find it on the website. You'll, you, you can learn how to optimally form and balance an advisory team. And we give you 27, or excuse me, 24 uh, characteristics to look for. Um, if you don't find that audio on my website, email me. Okay, last but not least, we've hinted at this all along. Uh, number 11 of 66 factors that are undermining businesses or making them stronger when they come to market. Volatility of the buy-sell marketplace. And I'm talking about for this kind of company, the one, you're, one, the one that's on the table. And I'm also talking about how volatile that market is for strategic or financial corporate buyers. Or, or what about individual buyers? To what degree is their marketplace consistency. Beware, if you cannot evaluate whether a particular kind of business or industry can maintain a particular standard of buy-sell transactions with minimal variation or minimal marketplace volatility. Okay, one more time, we're almost done. One more time. The fatal flaw is underappreciating the importance of the elements that contribute to sustainable competitive advantages. For it's the sustainable competitive advantages that empower the marketability and liquidity of a company. The more marketability, which means the demand by buyers, the more liquid. And that can maximize a company's selling price and minimize its time on market. So let me know if what I've said is useful. You'll hear more Street Smart ideas about deal making and business if you subscribe at partneroncall.com to receive email announcing my occasional podcasts. This is Ted Leverett of Partner On Call Network thanking you for listening to this podcast. Okay, here are two more resources that are helping people who are wanting to buy a business. First, my book for searchers, how to prepare yourself and find the right business to buy. And then my other book is for when you found the deal that you wanna do, you can avoid mistakes and make a better deal. How to buy the right business the right way. You'll save time, you'll save money, you will achieve better deals, but you have to do what the savviest buyers do. And I can help you deploy the tactics in those books. Go to my website, partneroncall.com. I'm Ted Leverett, the business buyer advocate with Partner On Call Network. Hey, let's Zoom if you wanna continue this. Thanks for listening.